There you go, kiddos. We are we are we are um, being recorded. And we're going to go live anyway. So when we talk about Odin's search for wisdom, there's a lot of information that goes with that. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of talk about it. Everybody wants to be a wanderer and everybody wants to, uh, they want to look at just, just Odin walking around with a stick, kind of like Gandalf and Lord of the Rings. I mean, that's large, that's predominantly the image that's created when we think of those kinds of things. <laughs> and um, I, what really kind of, what really kind of got me thinking on this slide was a conversation I had earlier this week and then it brought to mind the interview I had with uh, Freya Aswin, and she said it all comes from the same well. And that kind of started, that, that kind of tricked something else. And then a person I said made a post. I think it was, uh, I think it was Paul made a post to Noble Minded Heathen about uh, you might have been in this for 10 years. You might know the, the poetic and the prosetic. You might even know the Puthar. You might know a few things. and and, but if you haven't figured out how to use all that to incorporate yourself into the world you live in, you really kind of missing the boat. And that was a premise put forth by Joseph Campbell, that whenever a, a tribe would move into an area, they would incorporate themselves into the environment in which they live. They're not going to practice jungle warfare in a temperate forest. It's not going to work, right? So they're going to learn how to hunt in that area. They're going to, they're going to integrate themselves into the environment in which they live. We live in such a strange time in our environment. We're really not connected with it. We're largely separate from, from much of what we do with the cities and the, and the communities in which we live. We, um, we don't really know how to do that. Now, it's beginning to emerge amongst a bunch of us. And I, returning to the land is such a corny phrase. But we are beginning to become aware of how much we do affect the environment. And it, that path is kind of a search for wisdom too, isn't it? Because our grandparents knew how to do that shit. They could plant a garden and, and, and have a harvest and blow your lips off. We'll go out there and try to plant a pretty little garden and just, it, what? Nothing happens. Um, and seen, you've seen people do that. But that's, a, that's, that's one aspect of a search for wisdom. So when we look at Odin's search for wisdom, we gotta ask ourselves what, First off, we're going to talk about what it looks like. The second most important thing we've got to look at is uh, why. See, because I can do a lot of things in this world. I can do a lot of things for love. I can do a lot of things for my family. I can do a lot of things for my friend. And most, one of the most important things, I want to have a clear conscience at the end of the day. I want to be able to sleep well at night. I may not necessarily be happy because there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in the world. People get hurt. People, people die throughout your life. Think of all the people that will eventually pass away in your life. Think of um, the tragedies that will occur. Think of the struggles that people have had with anxiety and depression in this coronavirus horseshit. Now, how do you make it through all that stuff when we're simply looking at, well, open search for wisdom? Well, sometimes to put one foot in front of the other, your life has to have a little bit of meaning. Now, can we distill that down to a simple academic book report because that's been for the most part the case with much of heathenry today uh, for the last 20 years is or 30 years or 40 years um, a book report will suffice uh, the ability to uh, expound uh, in a profound manner the the wisdom that you think you've learned or read about and as i've pointed out um, plato was talking about thought and the invention of writing is that you've created this writing but Though they might read it, they possess not the wisdom or the, of the, or the wisdom of it, because there's been no mentor. So what we have in our lore is this. We have one example that we really start with, and it's a real amazing example, but we don't even really learn what the, why is he doing this? Is he just walking around someday and decided, I'm going to hang myself on that tree? Well, shit, no. There were some things going on in his life. So when, we, when, we, when our life has some kind of a meaning, some kind of reason to put one foot in front of the other. It might simply be loving your children. It might simply be in the best partner you can be. It might simply be trying to grow. You know, and that's a difficult thing to do if there's not pain. 
There's some kind of suffering that does that. Um, we, we love our children more. There's a real value to our children. What if we lose one? See, so there's an intensity created with that. And well, life has some kind of meaning. Well, our spirituality ought to have some kind of meaning too. And it's largely been absent because we've been bamboozled with the idea of a, of a sufficiently well-worded book report with lots of $5 words or some kind of political idea, be it on the right or on the left. The people that they say hate, the people that hate those people that they think that hate. <laughs> you know, now all of a sudden otters are racist. I mean, yeah, come on now, this is kind of getting silly. And I hope it's not because of something I wrote, because last two books ago, I wrote a bunch about otters. <laughs> Blew my mind today when I saw that. By right? The you know what they <laughs> otter is, it's sneaky bastards. <laughs> So what they've done is they've devalued that term. It really doesn't mean anything if somebody calls you that now. There's no value in being called. I mean, it, it, if, if, well, if everything's racist, we, what, who's the, what's the big deal? So we got to negotiate all of that with this spirituality. And we literally are really reinventing the wheel um, of this ancient faith that provided, and whether anybody likes it or not, it provided purpose, guidance, and direction for millions of people for thousands of years before this blip in the timeline of history called Christianity even began to emerge. Most Christians today never realized that the majority of their ancestors worshiped ancient pagan gods and did very well in life before that came along. It's just the reality of it. And there's a group of us here that are looking at it again. Well, what's our meaning in this? Now we could grab a hold of high-minded ideas but at some point, we got to boil it down to something real simple. And for myself, I think one of the most important things I can do is escort those closest to me along this path of life for however long I'm around with as much love as possible. And they might be here for a day or a couple of weeks or a couple of months or several years, or they might be part of my life, like my children or a partner or my mother and father. So when we walk along in that, when I've got a meeting, I'm going to do the right thing because I want them to understand how much I love them. That's a real important thing to consider. So when we're looking at our spirituality, where does it point us in that direction? Or does it even point us in that direction? Am I simply supposed to be the, the magnificent brute willing to hew the head off of someone that's got a a, a, a beguiled tongue or a split tongue or talking out the side of his head or making vague book posts about people that are supposed to be close to you. I mean, is that, you know, cause you can get wrapped up in that too. And it doesn't do anything but cause us pain. So when we first look at, at the, uh, at Odin's search for wisdom, everyone first thing they think of is Odin on the tree. They don't think about why he got on the tree. Okay, so if you if you look at the at the at the at the Veluspa and the Havamon, the Veluspa, and he lost the war. So here's a being that has shaped, literally shaped men and women, a vessel for divine energy that Rig fills. It's a very important thing. A vessel for divine energy, an extension of the gods themselves, walking about this world, learning all kinds of different things. That's a pretty neat thing to consider. All of a sudden, I got an inkling of an idea of what it might mean to be someone that's paying attention to the world they live in, that is incorporated into the environment in which they live. I can become aware. I can be present in the moment, which seems to be a huge struggle for so many people. I can be fully present when I'm talking to someone. That's a really neat thing. But I digress. So he lost his throne. He got his butt whipped by the Vanir. Now, if I build something great, and I have in the world, well, long before I ever stuck my toes in these waters, I built magnificent things. My service in the army was exemplary. My, my record was great. My business uh, adventures were equally satisfying. Twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month was not uncommon. And then I dipped my toes into this, and it's a new realm, so I got to learn new rules. When you lose something like that, and it might be because you lose someone you love, it might be because 
you self-sabotage because somewhere deep inside, uh, you don't really believe that you're worth it. There's a lot of pain that goes with that. And that's when people start looking for meaning in their spirituality. That's when people show up at the doors of the church or make a phone call to find out if there's someone that worships these ancient pagan gods of whatever spirituality they wish to follow. Some become Buddhist. Some get tied up in yoga. That's a, that's a pun intended. Some, some become Hindu. Some follow Shinto. You know, they find a different spirituality that might provide some kind of answer or meaning other than, well, I forgive you. Because the probationary status of that lifestyle doesn't always suit the needs of what we were meant to be. If we're ever to become something more, we've got to really take some kind of examination. So we have this first example of a, of a man who loses his wife, loses his, his magnificent golden city, loses his position and authority. And there's lots of men in their 30s and 40s and lots of women in their 30s and 40s who know exactly what that feels like to have given it your best, laid it all out on the field and tried hard and come up short. Failed. Nope, you don't get to make it. Deny it. To do your best and come up short is a real bad thing for most people. And some people never come out of it. Some people never recover from that. And yet we have here, Odin goes wandering. He just walks away from it all. And I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to try my best and come up short. I know what it feels like to fail. I know what it feels like to not be considered good enough in someone's eyes. I know what that feels like, and it hurts. And yet here we have this, this powerful chieftain. He goes wandering. Who knows how long he wandered? It could have been generations. It could have been ages as far as we know. And he does end up on that tree. I ween that I hung on the windy tree, hung there for nights full nine. With the spear, I was wounded. All of us have been pierced, wounded painfully. It's a, we've all been wounded somewhere in life by either our own misconceptions or perceptions of the actions of other people or our own self-destructive behaviors. We have pierced ourselves many times and offered I was to Odin, myself to myself. And that's all we're doing. And these self-destructive behaviors is hurting ourselves. But that's a gift in one way. On the tree that none may ever know what root beneath it runs. And I know for myself, I know what it feels like to sit in a room by yourself and hurt. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, especially men. Nobody wants to sit, nobody wants to talk about what that's like. No woman wants to talk about it. Well, nobody cares, nobody wants to hear. When you get to that point, you're in trouble. Because you got to figure out one of two things. Do you have a meaning in your spirituality that will allow you to get up and try it again? Do you have a meaning in your spirituality that goes beyond the face value arguments and book reports that we consider to be valid? None made me happy with loaf or horn. Yeah, I know exactly what that feels like. And there below I looked. I took up the runes shrieking I took them and forthwith back I fell. So an unseen hand cuts him from that tree. Nine mighty songs I got from the son of Bolthorn, Bessler's father. These are his ancestors. And a drink I got of the goodly mead poured out for most for here. Now that drink of goodly mead is key because there's something very important about that. The lady with the mead cup is one of the most repeated recurring themes throughout heathenry and important situations and settings. The lady with the mead cup provides that drink of goodly mead, Sigurd, Sig, uh, Sigurd and Sigurdrifa or Brunhilde, um, that's a real important beginning to a powerful moment of relationship. That doesn't last the test of time because there's confusion and beguiling and witchcraft and the world works against two people that need to love each other. But in that one moment, there was a drink of the goodly mead. Then I began to thrive and wisdom to get. I grew and well I was. Each word led me on to another word and each deed on to another deed. So we got something real powerful here. So as he's hanging at that moment where he's about to die, at that moment where he is looking right at the sun facing goddess and she's fixing to say, come on in, buddy, I got you. <laughs> the doors open and he hears the songs of his ancestors. And as he falls, he picks up 
in much pain. I mean, like many of us, we make the realization of where we made the mistakes in life when we're in the most amount of pain, when we're dealing with those things that cripple other people that can't get up and go on. Well, Othan in this point picked up the jeweled, he picked up the multifaceted jewels of the runes, that, that jeweled form of the songs that he heard of his ancestors, that wisdom. Every ancestor has a torch, a light of inspiration, and the wisdom that they hold. Kenaz is a part of that. And he picked up the runes. He picked up the collected wisdom of all of his ancestors in the runes. And we have it all. And they, they write out the path of a man's life if you read them in order. And individually taken, they each represent powerful things that allow us to shape our thoughts, create our realities. Few things focus our thoughts, like the ideas of the runes. Some people will get that, some people won't. Take it for what you will. This is a search for wisdom. This is the death of a part of himself, so he might go forward and become something more. And in sacrificing part of himself, and I usually use the word as ego, his, I, the image that he created of himself, the idea that I think uh, I am, that is the idea that I'm going to operate in the world on. And sometimes that causes me the most pain. But what you got to realize is as he killed, as he got rid of it, as he divested of himself, those things that caused him his seat, his throne, his wife, his fortune, everything that he held as special to him, as he got rid of that, look what he learned. Hey man, I'm uh, I'm live right now. Want to say hi? <laughs> so, when you get to that point in life where you go through that trial and that suffering and that aloneness, and, I, and there's few things in the world that scare people more than being alone. What's the most terrifying thing that a man, even in the toughest of situations, can imagine? It's being alone with his own fucking thoughts or a woman being alone with her own thoughts and no seeming way to deal with it, no seeming way to change that thought, no seeming way to deal with it, no, not being able to sleep. So whenever people are facing the ideas of suicide, that's one of the things we, we fail to understand is it's, it's not all of us that, that that's being rejected in the situation. It's one aspect of our being that needs to be set aside so we can go on, go back, and return as the individual worthy of sitting on that throne, worthy of being Frigga's partner. There's a real special thing. So that search for wisdom there begins with sacrifice. And everybody talking, and I love talking about it. I think it's a wonderful, powerful tale. I mean, there's so much depth in it. Imagine that, you know, it was put down on paper a thousand years ago, but that tale was told, you know, sitting around a fire in the middle of winter somewhere. There was an elder in a village telling these small children, of this tale and it was inspiring them to remember to try one more time. Get up and try it again. I mean, if nothing else, what kind of warrior will that make? What kind of husband will that make? What kind of wife will that make? What kind of king or queen will that make? Because that's why these stories were told. They were building the most important. They were investing in the next generation with these tales of individuals. And we get this tale and even if you get nothing else from it, sometimes you're going to find, get up and try it one more time. Most of the time, when we talk about the search for wisdom, that's kind of where it stops. Now, anybody that's been around, it goes a little bit further. He goes, he doesn't just travel one path to earn this wisdom. He continues to seek that improvement to make him what he needs to become. Now, there's another one, too, that you kind of get confused a lot of the time, and it has to do with uh, Cavassier's Mead, the Mead of Inspiration, the, the poet's boon. And we look at it as something really tricked. And I think a lot of it has to do with the way it's written in the Havamal. But in other stories, it's told in a much different tale. <laughs> the well-earned beauty well I enjoyed, little the wise man lacks. So Ophir now has been brought to the midst of the men of earth. Only three drops fell, but apparently it was enough to inspire generations upon generations of poets and scholars to sing tunes that inspire warriors and to, and to write poems to inspire the lover's heart. 
Hardly methinks would I have come and left the giant's land had not Gunloth helped me, the maiden good whose arms about me had been. So in that brief moment, we also have this, see, sometimes we brush up against the ideas of love. Sometimes we brush up against those moments of passion that touch us. And we got really kind of a choice as to what to do with that. Do we grow from it? And see this, I see this with, with Gunloth and, and Odin. And I read a story and I don't know how much legitimacy is in it or not, but it was a, it was a wonderful idea that the product of that union of these two individuals that had holed up and she shared with him that goodly mead. Once again, this woman is sharing with him a drink of the goodly mead was Bragi. Now, what kind of wonderful thing might that be? So I really, have, there's a lot of charm in that tale, though I can't tell you that there's a source for that at all. But if it helps provide you with some kind of meaning as to how you want to do these things, what beauty might occur? What wonderful thing might occur if I chance to love some individual? Why, who knows how far it goes? Might not go anywhere, but it leaves such a lasting mark on Odin and he gets the drink of the goodly mead that provides that, that, that syrup, that recipe, that, that magical drink that inspires men to write down these wonderful things. That's, that's another search for wisdom. And we might try to put that, we might try to humanize the actions of that individual, but when we try to humanize the actions or the interactions of the divine, we make a, a terrible mistake when we try to put force our ideas and limited thoughts upon the actions of the divine. We have no more connection to how the divine interacts than do the sun and the moon and the stars. And yet when we humanize that, we lose the ability, we lose the respect and reverence of what it means to touch something very special. So there's a lot more to that too, but that's also a search for, for wisdom. But would it really hurt if something like that got out to humanity? Why, it might have been a wonderful boon to all of us. It might have overpowered our imagination. Maybe it'll take us to the next level. Maybe we weren't ready to sit and feast at the table of the Godship. Maybe there was more learning, more suffering, more journeys of our own to undertake before we really got a drink of that goodly meat. But it created an enemy. The footnote said, here the name of the magic meat itself, whereas in stanza 141 is the name of the vessel containing it. So, oh, for a year, I can't pronounce that. It was mine. I can't roll those R's. So it was either the mead or the vessel containing it. Odin had no intention of bestowing any of the precious meat upon men, but as he was flying over the earth, hotly pursued by Sutung, he spilled some of it out of his mouth, and in this way, mankind also won the gift of poetry. So, when you think of those terms, the meaningful actions of how we pursue the understanding of gaining knowledge for ourselves always has the unintended benefit of helping those around us. And if the meaning of our lives is as simple as escorting those closest to us with as much love as possible along this path of life, and we're in a meaningful search for that kind of inspiration and wisdom and that kind of growth, why it's going to affect positively the lives of those people closest to us. And that might go even further than that. Mine has. I don't see why yours couldn't too. So this is the second path on the search for wisdom. And the third one we also know about. And that was in the Voluspa. And it's interesting, too, because Mimir, in some cases, is, is his uncle. But I know of the horn of Heimdall, hidden under the high-reaching holy tree. On it there pours from Valfather's pledge a mighty stream, would you yet know more? Alone I sat when the old one sought me, the terror of gods, and this is Odin himself, and gazed in mine eyes. What hast thou to ask? Why comest thou hither? Odin, I know where thine eye is hidden. I know where Odin's eye is hidden. Deep in the wide-famed well of Mimir, mead from the pledge of Odin each morn does Mimir drink. Would you yet know more? Necklaces had I, and rings from here, Father. Wise was my speech and my magic wisdom. Widely I saw over all the worlds. 
Well, that's a hell of a thing to pick up on if you give it an eye. Just gonna put it in that well and all of a sudden. So you sacrifice the ability to see, to know all things. You sacrifice part of yourself to once again, rule the things you built. There's a lot of that stuff that comes, that becomes very important on this search for wisdom in Odin's travels. The sacrifice of his eye into the well to know all things is of no small consequence. So what kind of sacrifice are we willing to make to learn that wisdom? Because I assure you, that's the kind of thing that gives our life meaning. Far more so than some of the simple things I see being promoted as what we're really doing here. Because everything we do here goes well beyond the routine observations that we have of life and the society we live in. Now, if we want to change the world, we've got to start by changing ourselves. We've got to begin our own search for wisdom. And simply parroting the ideas of some 17th or 18th or 19th century individual, or even 20th century, I keep forgetting we're in the 21st century. If we want to parrot some high-minded individual from the last 400 years, what are we recreating? What are we really doing? Are we advancing a search for wisdom? Or are we simply settling in with the thing that least requires us to change? Because that's a legitimate concern for most of what I see. I'll, I'll buy into this because I really don't have to change that much if I want to buy that. Oh, I like that book because it, well, it really bought it. That's part of my fantasy too. You see, none of what Odin did, he risked a broken heart. He sacrificed part of his ego. The most of people will lie, cheat, steal, kill to protect what they think they look like to everybody else. He gave up an eye. He didn't just figure out, well, this is kind of, I'm doing a lot here. I can kind of buy into that. I'll talk about that. And I'll seem pretty important. That's not how it works. That's not the divine kind of ideas that are represented by these ancient tales, nor is it the kind of divine ideas represented by many other tales in many other faiths, many very old faiths. <laughs> now, the Horn of Heimdall, there's also, I've heard, I don't remember who it was. It might have been Maria Cavallo. There's the idea that the shrieking horn is actually Heimdall's ear sacrificed in that well. And you'd have to research her work, and a lot of her work is pretty good. She's, um, we don't maybe see eye to eye on some of the, our perception of some things, but the idea that Heimdall would sacrifice an ear to see all things, and I, Odin would sacrifice an eye to know all things, there's some real magic involved in that, in a well at the base of the tree of the Axis Mundi, between the base human emotions, and the elevation to the high-minded spiritual ideas that are so prevalent in all of this lore. Now, this was written a thousand years ago. So I'm beginning to sense that our ancestors might have had a pretty good clue about what it means to be a good man or a good woman. It kind of tells me maybe I ought to pay attention to some of that and really kind of read what it means. It means I need to be willing to sacrifice some of these things if I ever want to be of any kind of meaningful worth or considered wise or caring when I become an old great grandpa. Much less right now. Will I make a wise decision? Will I say something that is meaningful? Will I offer compassion and caring? Will I be able to violently protect all of that if necessary? That's what we got to look at. Even when you got people around you that may not necessarily be saying those kinds of things about you when you're not there, it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, are we all on the right path? Are we all on the same sheet of music? Are we all trying to become something better? Or are we simply still trying to look right? I go back to oh, the sacrifice of himself to himself. Get rid of some of those perceptions we have of who we think we are and things become a lot easier Things become a lot clearer. When I, stop, when I stop trying to think about this idea that I have of myself and how important it is to project that to everybody and start trying to 
offer maybe the idea that there's a path of your own making that's from your own heart that helps you move forward in this world and not my idea, but necessarily, but something that my, I might say something to help you move to the next path. That's what it's really all about. Not that I'm more right than anybody else, but in our search for wisdom, there's a path over there for you. You're built perfectly to follow that path. That's what we're supposed to be doing for each other. Not insisting that if you don't believe this way, you, you're not, you're not right. Well, they got their own path. Let them follow that path. Let them see where it takes them. And if they follow it with an open mind and a strong heart, it might lead them right back to you. Might walk a little bit further down the path together. See, because we've got to start talking about something bigger than what we've been talking about. If we're ever going to begin to attract the attention of individuals who are still very much searching and unwilling to make that sacrifice and terrified to give up an eye, and terrified to brush up against those ideas of love because it might cause too much pain. These are the things we need to be offering to individuals so they might step forward into something that we all kind of catch glimpses of, be it in dreams or in the world around us or in interaction with friends. How do we put that together so other people say, hey, you know what? I want some of what that guy's got working in my life. How are you doing that? And I tell you right now, I don't insist that you believe it, but this is what's working for me. This is what's making my life pretty good. I sleep pretty good. See, these are the things that we need to be looking at. Not the kind of righteously indignant ideas that fire people up, but the kind of ideas that bring us together. In those special moments, that's what makes it all worthwhile. So when we look at it and we look at that journey, now let's take a careful look. Is he the only one doing this? Because that's all we ever see. But let's take a look at Thor. We look at all of his tales. He's got a much different role than Odin. So you'll kind of see what I'm talking about with other people have their different path. Thor has a different role. He's the warder of mankind. He's the big strong protector. He's the defender. He carries the hammer, the belt, and the gloves. Does he not get bamboozled by the magic of the world? Does he not get confused and tussle against things he cannot possibly defeat, though he's been lied to? He's been, he's been deceived by magic, and he continues to struggle. He does magnificent things, but he doesn't even know it. So all through the lore, here's this great, gigantic titan of an individual who is the warder of mankind, who will whip a dude's ass in a heartbeat. A slayer of giants, struggling, fighting all the way, fighting tooth and nail. I know a lot of men like that, fighting tooth and nail against everything that comes up to them in the world, fighting. It's the only thing I know how to do. Let's get it on. Let's fight for it. Let's yell. Let's be angry. Let's fight for it. And yet at the end of the day, when an unworthy suitor shows up to woo his daughter, that's not what we find, is it? We find an individual that has learned from his past and from his struggles and become the individual worthy to stand in the door and say, no, that's not how this is going to work. So does he not also go on a search for wisdom? Because that's exactly how he culminates as a wise father, isn't it? And that's what I'm talking about for us as well. We've got to culminate in the thing that makes us a wise father. Do we not also see Freya constantly searching, her tears of gold washing up on the seashore? Searching for that man as she continues to raise her daughters, whose names literally mean treasure. Do we not also find Freya in a search for wisdom? The Brisingaman gem and what she endures with the, with the, with the dwarves. Well, see, the Brisingaman gem, that's the fires of the human intellect. They reside around the neck of a goddess that stands for love and abundance and prosperity. And we might want to humanize that interaction in some kind of base, into some kind of base idea, but we also cannot comprehend the interaction of the divine. How does something like that create such a wonderful necklace around love? But 
buyers of human intellect. We're seeing them in jail. What an amazing thought that is. Her search for wisdom also yielded results. Frigga has her own search for wisdom in dealing with the loss of her son. Balder and Nana, they have their own search for wisdom in an entirely different realm, separated from everything they know as they pass through Hell's Helheim. With the sun facing goddess herself, placing him in the high seat as he collects the, the knowledge of all of those his ancestors that have passed on before him, just like his father did, hanging on the tree. So that when it's time for him to be the ruler, there he is. Does not Frey also have to make a journey to search for wisdom? His culminates in love, and at the end of the day, he has sacrificed what he needed to sacrifice to brush up against that eternal idea that inspires men and women's hearts. At the end of the day, he fights everything with, with the horn of, with the stag's horn. Now there is, above all of the Clovis culture sites in North America, there is a mat of black ash. And I love how this tale kind of brought this to my mind. You know, how old that tale is, we really don't know, but with the younger Dryas comment, you know, there were continent-wide wildfires. I want you to imagine a wildfire burning across the entire continent. And I want you to imagine a great man with a loving family and he's out there fighting that fire with an elk handled implement with everything he's got. All of a sudden, there's a real passion that comes with it. Is that not also a search for wisdom when we begin to feel that? Now we're talking. Every one of those divine beings, and Tyr, we can't forget Tyr. Tyr has to go back to get that cauldron that's a mile wide to brew that brew that meat of the gods. He has to go back and deal with a arrogant old man, kind of a factory working fishing son of a gun, got something smart ass to say about everything. And well, this, and my God, they just don't. We all know that kind of man. We've probably all been raised by one. It is the warder of men that accompanies him on that journey as he deals with his own family to secure his heritage and share it with that community that he loves, that he's willing to make a sacrifice of his own hand for at the wolf's joint. See, there's something real special in that. Is that not also a search for wisdom, a journey for understanding? All of those gods that form that community that Odin pulled together, all of them have been searching. All of them have accomplished a certain aspect of their own search for wisdom to become a powerful, unified, very well-respected tribe that dominates everything around them. Whoa. Now all of a sudden we're looking at something real special. Now all of a sudden we begin to understand each of us has a wonderful path that we got to grab a hold of with both hands, grab it by the nose, whip its ass, figure it out, suffer, bleed, cry, deal with it, and become something more. And it sucks. But we got a source of inspiration, don't we? We got a set of examples above us that we can hardly fathom how they interact with each other. That's something special. You can put whatever dressing you want to on it. You can try to put whatever dressing you want to get people to believe what you're saying. You can fire them up with righteous indignation and hate and love and whatever kind of comment you want to put together. Patriotism and freedom and all these other things. But when you begin to offer somebody meaning of a spirituality, like the one I just outlined, and the gods and goddesses and everything they've been through, now all of a sudden we're talking about moving something forward that needed to be moved forward 40 years ago. Because I got to tell you, this morning I woke up and I looked around at some of it, just a cursory glance, and I thought, this ain't going anywhere, guys. All day I thought about it. All day I wrestled with it. And I look at it now, I've been doing this for a year. And I'll be danged if right before I went on, they didn't get a message and I'll, I'm gonna read this. And uh, basically she said she has those good days that her husband calls Brian Wilton days because she's read something I wrote. And then she has some days that are bad days because she's not paying attention to it. She's drifted off her own search for wisdom. That means something. That means something. We can't deal with everybody in the same way. Sometimes we gotta love people at arm's length, but we can always support those individuals on their search for wisdom 
with some kind of compassion. It ain't easy, but we gotta try because that's the example our gods have set for us. So when you begin to think about what you're doing and where you're going with this spirituality and what you wish to see accomplished, what's the meaning behind your actions? What are you looking to accomplish? What are you trying to build? Who are you trying to love? That's really all that fucking counts. Because this is all we have right here and right now in this moment. Whoo! So having said all that, I'm done. Thanks for listening. Anybody got any love questions? You, Brian. <laughs> you got me all you know, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you, guys. Now, I think Melissa's got some things to do since we've been doing this for a year. We're going to give away a uh, celebration. <laughs> we're going to give away two books. We're going to give away an audio book, and we're going to uh, give away a, a one-hour one-on-one session with me. I don't know how much that one's worth, but I'm, I got a joke or two I'm pretty good at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's going to be good. Right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I want to tell everybody thank you for being a part of this for the whole last year. It started out with just a little group of people, and Brian had a really good idea. You know, he wanted uh -huh. to do what you did. You had a great idea. He wanted to do something that mattered because he was frustrated at the time and uh, focus on something positive. And what could he do about it? I got a lot of respect for that. You know, sometimes we just look around and we get pissed off when things aren't going the way we want, and we bitch about it, but we don't really come up with a plan. You know, so uh, he can't fix everything on his own, but he can actually take an action that will hopefully make a difference. And I think he has. I think he's done a really good job in the last year. <clears throat> That's right. Don't record the good stuff about yourself. That's right. Just let it go. <laughs> I just stopped the, I stopped the, uh, I just stopped the uh, Facebook Live, and I'm probably going to stop this recording, too. <laughs> all right so um what we're gonna do then is i took we had some birthday posts that were made in the